thanks for joining this talk. Um, it's about a project that I uh, started a while ago uh, when I had found uh, a couple of really old stereo speakers in the trash. The nice thing in Amsterdam is that, that uh, trash is just in the streets once per week, so you can, if you have to get rid of larger things, you don't have to like make appointments or so the stuff just ends up in the street. And I found a pair of speakers which are unfortunately too big for me to bring. So I have these which are quite decent. But the idea was, okay, there's a lot of, there's a lot of cheap uh, speakers around, and uh, of course they are passive because they are old. And how good could they actually be if we threw a lot of DSP at them? That was, that was my question. Um, you see, I have animated slides here. So um, I will now, like... <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. So, yeah, my name is Jan. I'm, I work as a sound engineer. I'm uh, very happy to be here. I'm not actually much of an electronics person or a tinker or not even a real programmer. I do program, but it's usually paint by numbers. That's why I'm into open source. So I steal somebody else's code, I look at it, I modify it, and then I run with it. And this is what I've been doing here. Mas basically, what I'm going to talk about is... Um, uh, how to connect stuff in uh, like more on a systems administration kind of level. So that is the that is the kind of uh, starting point. Uh, all cheaper uh, speakers are really cheap. You probably have some. Uh, and then the problem is that to tune a speaker acoustically and mechanically for good performance, by which I mean uh, good impulse response, uh, linear. Uh, frequency response, that is really hard and that is why uh, high fidelity loudspeakers in the past were ridiculously expensive. Because if you need to get that right with the mechanics of the drivers and the damping and the design of the, of the enclosure, you have to throw a lot of engineering at it. So if you can make a passive speaker that you just connect to an amplifier channel and it sounds great, that is fucking hard to do. On the other hand, uh, once cheap DSP uh, gets in, uh, then it's quite easy. Um, you don't find that so much because then we are in, in that market area of active speakers and that used to be the domain of studio monitors and that kind of stuff and it wasn't really marketed to end users. So end users tend to have a lot of passive speakers that you connect to your hi-fi gear. Um, and uh, the way it's wired also in your living room is usually you have long speaker leads and all the signal stuff is, is concentrated where your hi-fi component tower used to be. Uh, and of course that changes rapidly with all the intelligent speakers, but still there's a lot of old speakers around. And uh, I think that's where it, ge where it gets interesting because these can be had very cheaply. So what I'm doing here is I'm uh, using a Raspberry Pi uh, infrastructure, and like I said, I'm not um, I'm not a, a a hardware person. Uh, now I have to yeah, sorry, I just have to find the right font size to make the uh, animation perfect. Again, I'm sorry, I had to. Yeah, okay, now the tabs are off. But uh, basically, this is about using off-the-shelf Raspberry Pis, which you all know, and I combine them with a product. Uh, made in Switzerland by a company named Hi-Fi Berry. It's very high quality stuff. It's not totally cheap, but in my opinion, it's really worth it. So what I'm using is, is a Hi-Fi Berry. I happen to have a four, but an old one that you have around will, will do. It just limits the amount of DSP that you can do. And I'm ad using this add-on board, which, which is called an AMP2. It just sits on top of the GPO, uh, GPIO header. And uh, it provides you with uh, two channels of up to 30 watts and that's quite decent for home use. Um, also what it does is it backpowers the Raspberry Pi, so you get rid of the normal Raspberry Pi uh, power supply. Instead what you need is um, a switch power supply. It gives you 60 watts at 18 volts. Stupidly enough, it's really hard to come by 18 volts power supplies, but that's what they chose. Um, and Probably yes. It, it, it has a. I know you're joking, but actually, it, it can take up to 24. The problem is that for some reason the thermal 
uh, behavior gets worse and worse. So there is a sweet spot depending on the impedance of the speaker and how high you would go. If you run it at 24, you can. It's just that these things will dissipate a lot of unneeded power. I think 19 should not be a problem at all. Yeah. Okay, so this is what, what I've been using, and you can see that it's a total takeaway price of just over 100 euros, and probably you have a Raspberry Pi. So that, that for me, that sounded interesting to, uh, to be able to spiff up a speaker. Um, and also, now what this does is, the, unfortunately, the, the uh, amp has, does not have any analog inputs. So this is still, this is already enough to stream audio from your computer or from any other digital source via the network. But if you want to add analog I.O., say you have like your turntable freak like I am, or you even have a, t I even have a, like a real to real tape machine that I might want to include there, I can buy, uh, build a second box, just another Raspberry Pi. And then there's another thing that these Swiss guys make, and it's, um, it's this thing. It's called a DAC plus ADC and it has an analog output on RCA connectors, and for some stupid reason, it has a really good analog input on a stereo mini jack. I don't know what they've been smoking there. Is there a question? Yeah. yeah. The audio injector sound cards. Yeah. Yes, I actually, I have them. Uh, uh, there's the Octo, <laughs> which is, is Really, it's crazy engineering. It gives you, uh, let me get this right, six channels in and eight channels out via a single I2S uh, interface. That's quite insane. I'm not using it because um, it doesn't measure as well as this one does, but it's, it's great stuff. I can totally recommend it. There's a two-channel version, which is really nice. I have one. I measured it, and it's, it's pretty much equivalent to this. But uh, the stuff is a lot more do-it-yourself. So you have to assemble it yourself. It's a huge stack. It's a, it's a great product. Uh, but um, I, was, I was sticking to this because it's, uh, it's just a personal preference. Actually, any, anything that I'm going to talk about is pretty much uh, neutral to your choice of audio hardware. You can even replace any of this with a, a, a USB sound card that you might have lying around. So it's not like I'm endorsing this uh, uh, Hi-Fi Berry stuff. Uh, and the Octo is actually is quite insane. It's a lot of fun, especially if you do analog synthesis. The only problem I had with it, like if you really beat the system hard and you get jack to X run, because it multiplexes eight channels on a single I2S, and the I2S semantics is it ha just has a notion of a, of a frame clock. It says left, right, left, right. And what the Octo does is one, two, three, which looks like one, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then you have to know when to start counting. And I don't know if anybody has used really old DMX lighting gear. There's this funny thing when any kind of fixture gets the starting count wrong, right? And then you have a scanner, and then tilt becomes color wheel, and, and pan becomes dimmer, and stuff like that. It's really, it makes for a nice show that is different every night. <laughs> um, and if you really mistreat the audio injector octo, which basically means you have to jam jack, you have to really like run it into complete uh, um, saturation CPU-wise, then it loses track, and then it randomly shuffles your uh, channels. Um, if you can deal with that, like if for an experimental stuff, it's great. I, I was just not looking. It, it rarely happens. Like if you control your CPU, it's, it's perfectly stable. The only problem with that one is that I found it measures a bit, uh, a bit worse. It is a bit noisier, but for home use, it's, it's perfectly fine. All right. Um, no, you can, you can use the same one. The, same, the, the reason I'm, uh, I'm using uh, two boxes is because I'm using audio over IP streaming using Fons Adriansen's Zeta uh, N2J bridge. Uh, so all my stuff gets into the network somehow. And it easily also enables me to have some kind of party mode at home. So I just, I just broadcast, the I, I multicast the audio on the network, and then I could put a speaker here, I put a speaker there, and there, and there, and it just takes the same stream, which is why this is my basic presumption, but it doesn't have to be that way. So you can easily just use jack. If you just have a single node, then you can completely get rid of the network layer that's there. Um, but the, the interesting thing for me was I just wanted a box that you switch on and it works which is harder than it sounds, because, of course, it needs to be headless. And um, 
I wanted uh, stuff that uses Jack and that uses the tools I know from my audio workstation. Um, but I wanted it to be completely auto-connecting. And I always failed to really dig session management in Jack. So I was, for me, it was always easy to just script the stuff rather than learn how a session management works and, and uh, how to make it useful for my, my uh, workflow. So I was thinking, OK, how can we do this? Um, features I'm, I'm looking at is I want reasonably low latency. I'm saying, OK, 30 milliseconds max, which is a lot for network streaming. But it's still just over one frame off for video. So in case you f pipe some, some sort of video-related audio through it, it'll still give decent lip sync. You can get it down if you like, really want it. You can, you can drop it down to almost 10 milliseconds, including network. But then it gets a bit more, um, more fragile. I wanted complete flexibility in DSP. So I wanted to use any LV2 plugin or Jack application. So what I was looking at to, to work with old speakers was I wanted EQ. I wanted limiting to not destroy the speakers. And I wanted very simple stereo optimization in case uh, my listening position is not optimally aligned within the stereo triangle. So that's really, really very, very simple stuff. What you can also do with the same system is you can put a convolver on it, and then if you obtain FIR correction for your loudspeakers, for instance, using DIC FIR by Dennis Sprajon, um, which gives you an inverse filter that has phase, uh, you can even do linear phase and stuff, you can run it there. You can just plug it in. It's just not what I'm doing, but it's certainly possible. Um, I wanted, well, not I wanted, I ended up with usable but absolutely not great remote administration because everything goes via SSH. And I made a really horrible, horrible uh, automatic browser interface for LV2 plugins, uh, which you're going to hate me for. But it does, it does the job. It features XSL style sheet transformations. And I think I deserve to roast in hell for that. Um, the, the reason is I wanted to, to auto-generate uh, it from uh, the LV2 metadata. And LV2 plugins, you can query them, and they will tell you, these are my ports, these are the parameter ranges, <laughs> these are the whatever. Uh, and it happens to be RDF, because Dave Robillard is uh, in love with RDF. And RDF kind of neatly transforms to uh, XML. And by some weird coincidence from a previous life, I knew how to do XSLTs. So I figured, OK, I've got these angle bracket nightmare things going. So then it's a short step to HTML. And then I made this interface, which I'm going to show you. It's, uh, it does the job. Of course, it would be a lot nicer to use a mod host with, with mod UI. But um, I found it a bit too uh, difficult to adapt it to what I wanted. But of course, that is probably a better option, specifically because actually my plugin host underneath is the mod host uh, from, the, from the mod project. Um, yeah, and what I wanted to do, um, I, was, I was putting this on, on, uh, on a Debian system, on a Raspbian system, and I didn't know how to use systemd. And I got really annoyed at systemd at some point, and then I got curious, and then I thought, hey, that has nice features. And then I got really frustrated because they weren't implemented yet or correctly or whatever. But during the last three Debian releases, systemd has become really nice. And with Buster, the current uh, release for Raspbian, it's actually quite nice. So systemd takes care of self-healing. For instance, if I, if I rip out a network cable, then my uh, Zeta and JBridge instance is going to die because there is no network. It will just give an error and stop. And systemd takes care of not only restarting it, but also I taught systemd, OK, this comes with connections as well. So if you, if you resurrect this system, you have to redo the connections as well. So basically, I used systemd as my uh, session manager. And that's another reason I'm probably going to roast in hell. <laughs> but the nice. <laughs> <laughs> but the nice thing, yeah, L Lennart is uh, probably, I've, I don't know. The, the weird thing is I've, I've I had a very mixed experience, of course, with systemd. Everybody has. But I've stopped bickering lately because the idea is great. And when it's finally completely implemented, actually, I think it's really nice. The, the frustrating thing is you, you read the docs, and then you get your own ideas. And you think, hey, based on these premises, I should be able to do this. And then you start. And then 
oh yeah, that feature isn't implemented yet, or not implemented correctly. And then you tell them, hey, guys, what, what about this? For instance, I needed to wait for the time to be synchronized to an NTP server, because if you uh, shift the time and you have a USB interface going, it's going to die a horrible death. So I needed Jack to wait for time synchronized. The problem is that, by default, the time synchronized signal is emitted as soon as some time service is started which is bullshit. And then there's another service that actually waits, which you have to enable, until time is really synchronized. So I had randomly dying USB interfaces, um, and I, I fixed that, fortunately, by this thing. And in Buster, it's easy. I used to do workarounds for this uh, previously. But yeah, that's that. Um, my DSP setup is quite simple. I'm using... Uh, uh, Fonts' uh, four-band equalizer in the version that, that uh, Robin uh, Garros made. Um, I use very simple, like I said, stereo optimization, which just allows me to individually delay and, and attenuate loudspeakers in case one is closer to me. Um, and I use a bit of limiting. But of course, you can also use ducking. You can combine several streams. You can use compression for your, like in the bathroom, if you have bad listening uh, surroundings, you can just dynamic range compress a little bit, whatever. Any, any plugin that you can think of. So also, this thing can just as well become an analog synthesis module with the same system. You bring it up, you configure it, and it, it comes back. And the software components I'm using, of course, is Jack D, is the, the mod host. Uh, you can actually use any other plugin host just as well. I, I started uh, playing around with InGen, but I had trouble um, getting it to compile on the ARM. Also, it, it was a bit crashy, but of course, that would also be a very interesting option. And yeah, like I said, System D starts everything and connects everything. And um, let's look at this now. So basically, um, each system comes up on its own. Is that read? Not really. Okay, um, let me. Uh, make that a bit bigger. Oh yeah, it works that way. Really, I'm blind as a bat, I'm sorry. Um, so, um, I brought this router because these things, they, they can do uh, link local networking, but sometimes it's not that reliable. So I have a DHCP server, I bring these things up, and then of course I, I nmap to actually find them. Also with, with decent auto connection, you can do that by name. So um, I'm going to um, log into one of these systems that I, I, uh, that I uh, set up. And this is actually the source. So this is the one that has the analog input. You can see here that this work I did on this thing is sponsored by a company who eventually plans to make a uh, um, commercial product out of it, but th all this that I'm t showing you today is, is up for grabs. It's on GitHub, and so if you want to use it, you're welcome to, to share it. Um, Are you offering like, a, like an image from the SD Not card yet, that we can actually, just use? I, I should really do that. So what I do is you, you get the latest Raspbian Buster image, and then you perform lots of stupid steps that are really hard to, to uh, automate because they involve changing the partition layout a little bit. And then there's a sort of bootstrapping scripts that you can run through, and then it will transform the Buster image into uh, what we're doing, which is a really stupid way to do it because, of course, internally I have a, an image and I just copy it. The, I just want it because I'm too lazy to write documentation, so I thought if I document each step that I do in a script, it should be really easy for colleagues or for other users to, to be able to figure out how it, how it works. Um, but I don't want to go through that, actually. I'm just going to um, give you a few... Um, yeah, this, we, we're going to look at a few things. And of course, you're welcome to always ask questions, and then this talk can basically go anywhere. So this thing comes up, and uh, like I said, it's headless, so there's no graphical goodness. So what I do is I use Jack LSP a lot, so it shows me what's running at the moment. So we have uh, a system. Uh, why doesn't it? Oh, yeah, here. Um, we have the this two-channel system. It has just output ports because no, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the this one. So it has capture and playback, um, and the capture port, the analog in port, is connected to something called effect one, which is 
um, a plugin, uh, sorry, it's a, it's a Jack client that is generated by ModHost. So ModHost will create individual um, Jack clients for each effect, which is, uh, makes it a bit hard to f because you don't see the name of the effect that's running there. Uh, and then you see it's basically a, sh uh, it's basically a, a chain of things. So effect one uh, goes into effect, I numbered it four, and nine is just, you know, you make a chain. You can just, just configure it. And then you have your, your whole plugin chain. And in the end, what happens is it goes out to a, uh, an instance of Zeta JN, J2N. So this will take the audio and put it on a, a broad, uh, sorry, on a multi multicast stream in the network. And then I can grab it with this other thing, which for that particular reason is called the uh, Sonoy Sync. And here, if you, if you look at the whole uh, plugin chain, it's almost the same. So I have the same plugins there, whether that's useful or not. But here you can see, OK, in the end, the playback, which is the amplifier, it, it gets the end of that plugin chain. Whereas the beginning here is there is a, the inverse, the, the Zeta network to Jack bridge, which grabs the multicast stream and feeds it into a chain of plugins. And um, these plugins are, you can't really configure them in a, in a nice way. There's no graphical way to do it. So I wrote a, uh, um, I wrote a, a, a scripting thing that will do that from a configuration file, um, which you can look at. I'm, that's not actually what I, what I want to talk about much today. But uh, the way it looks like, this is this horrible, horrible XSLT thing that I talked about. Um, the, the, ni the only nice thing is that this stuff is completely automated. So there's not a single handwritten line of code in there. It's just a direct transformation from the, um, from the metadata of the plugins. So for instance, in LV2, I can say LV2 LS, which will give me a list of all the plugins that are uh, installed in the system. And then for instance, I can look at, uh, oh, yeah, it was not a very good, uh, this is the one I'm looking for. So uh, this is an implementation of a four band, uh, four band equalizer. So then I can say LVS info and I address it by its unique ID. And then it will tell me, okay, these are all the parts I have. This is what it means. This, these are the constraints and stuff like that. And you can also get this in turtle format. You can convert the turtle into RDF XML. You can convert the RDF XML into this. And then what you get is a very simple way without any graphical niceties but it will let you control everything in real time and by ear. And that is what, uh, what the intention was, basically. Um, like I said, the plugin chain I'm using consists of uh, a parametric equali uh, equalizer. Um, what I did was I wrote this little speaker management plugin, which is basically just delay and attenuation. And the, the reason I'm using it is if you, s for instance, this is, th this is how you can place your speakers at home. But now you sit, let's say, where you are sitting, which means your stereo image will be pretty much non-existent. And also, you will all pretty much almost only hear this speaker. Now, this is an extreme offset. But what you can do is you can, you can delay this speaker to, be, to hit you at exactly the same time as this one. That improves things a lot. And then you can see, OK, this is a meter closer, so let's attenuate it by a couple of dB. And then you can, within limits, move the sweet spot to where you actually sit in your living room, which is quite interesting. Because, yeah, we all know that uh, you never get the stereo triangle just right, especially not if you have a partner that might not appreciate you know, everything be dominated by huge loudspeakers. So, um, yeah, and then what I, what I plug in is, is another one. This is, the, um, this is also is called by Fons Adriansen that, that uh, Robin uh, Gauss uh, ported to, to LV2. And uh, yeah, that's a limiter. It's just there to protect the speakers. And for that, you have to figure out how much they can take. So that's, um, yeah, that's a bit of hit and miss. So, um, 
just to make sure it still works. I have, um, I'm, I'm just using this laptop now to play analog audio out of the mini jack. It goes into this thing. It takes it through the jack chain, which currently is neutral. It doesn't do anything. So the limiter won't kick in, and the, um, the uh, equalizer is, is neutral. It will create the stream. Stream will multicast. This thing has requested a copy of that stream because it subscribed to that multicast group. And then it will play it back. And then there is hopefully something. Not at the moment. Oh, yeah, of course. I think this is, um, this is hot pluggable. Wait. Why? Why do I hear? Oh, that's strange. Because the, the, the noise g goes through but not the audio. Why is that? Because what you hear there, actually, this noise is being digitally captured and multicasted and played back. So I'm a bit confused now. Um, yeah, I have, uh, maybe I have a... Yeah, that was, but that was my built-in speakers when I unplugged. Um, okay, there's a tool I use very often that's called Jack Meter. Uh, so in order to figure out where the system gets lost now, uh, let me look at, yeah, it doesn't, hmm, I don't know what happened here. Uh, do we have an issue with the mixer? Or maybe I just uh, there's I think there's a bug in there when you uh, when you change these things then it will have problems. Okay, I'm sorry about that, but um, I think that's a that's a driver issue here. So let me just do uh, the brutal thing. Um, and while we wait for this to come back, um, let me show you a few of the things that I, I'm uh, using in terms of. Uh, System D script. So here's all the, the custom services that I, I made. And I'm using uh, mostly services. So this is the key service, of course, Jack D. We can look at that uh, service. And um, there is a a weird concept is a bit weird. That's the concept of target in system D. It's somehow, but not quite, like a run level in system 5. Um, and a target is basically, you can say, I want to depend on this target, which can be network is online, or we're in multi-user mode. And I created a target that basically says Jack is alive. And this target, of course, is is uh, uh, requisited by all the, is required by all the, the Jack clients, because otherwise it doesn't make sense. And you have to do that, because in system D there is no way of ordering um, a startup. So uh, system D will just scan all the services and start them at the same time. And it assumes that each individual service is, uh, is, is smart enough to check, oh, can I actually start already? And stay active and check what's going on and then do the right thing, which of course most of audio, most of the audio uh, scripts and, and programs don't do properly. So in order to work around this, there is a jack target. Um, and this one says requires jack target, which is confusing as hell because it doesn't require it. it what it means is requires is it will activate it. So basically, uh, when Jack has started successfully, it will flag that Jack target is acquired. So now everybody else can, who needs it can, can have it. And it's uh, before Jack target, so that means first we have to finish this service startup, and then the Jack target is, uh, is available. Uh, it, it's also sorted after the sound target, which is... Uh, on an ALSA driver level, so that means as soon as we know we actually have sound hardware, uh, it works. And there's this funny thing, uh, which is after the time sync 
target. And the time sync target is something that waits on your NTP synchronization or any other clock that you might have. Uh, and it, it holds Jack back until this target is acquired, uh, which is really important when you're using USB because it will kill the stream. If not, you don't have to like, really deal with it. And this is what, uh, what we all know from, from Jack configuration. We, we need uh, RT priority, real-time scheduling priority. We need to be able to memlock. That is, we, uh, we can tell the kernel to take the, the memory space of Jack and pin it to memory so that it never gets swapped out. The system has swap disabled anyways, but that's just the standard precaution. It runs as a normal user. That is really nice, so we don't have to run it with root or anything, even though it's a system. So as you can tell, each, each service, okay, you run as this user. And of course, I can make sure it's all the same user. Um, this is an interesting little hack that you need in order to be able to, um, to run Jack uh, headless. Um, and then this is what it actually does. It starts. Um, it starts uh, JackT, and it takes the options from an options file that I'm creating otherwise. Then, and the nice thing is that is really what, where systemd becomes fun. If it dies, it waits for five seconds, and it restarts it. And it will restart it on failure, which means if Jack has bailed out with an unclean signal, so it could be a sig ill, sig abort, but not a sig term, like a termination message, or it won't also restart if you tell it to stop. So that's quite nice. And then there's this install, which means that it's a standard part of the, the multi-user target. That used to be run level s three, I think, in system five. So the basic, like everybody can log in kind of thing. And I make it uh, part of this standard multi-user target so it gets activated. All right, and then uh, just let's look at another one for, for good measure. This is, a, this is a mod host. And here you can see that says binds to Jack target. And binds to means that if that target is not available, it's not even going to try to start. It'll just sit there until this thing comes up, which is exactly what we need in order to have the thing start up in the right order. Um, this one also wants a web server because um, it, 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 this thing doesn't really need a web server for anything. But as soon as this is alive, uh, I want to be able to use my web interface, which is why I put this in. This is arbitrary. That this has nothing to do with what mod host requires, right? And here you can see the same, um, same kind of environment uh, things. Uh, you can see this is a different type of service. It's a type forking, because mod host, if you start it on the command, you can see it will tell you mod host is ready, and it gives you the prompt back. So it forks itself into the background, uh, which is what you have to tell systemd so that it does the right thing. If you have um, a daemon that doesn't really become a daemon, it just sits there in the front, you can say type simple, and then um, systemd will take care of forking it off. Uh, and here you can see the same thing, restart every five seconds, restart on failure. And then here I'm using um, interesting features of systemd where you can say, okay, before you start this, you need to do some preparations. And this is, first of all, wait for upstream. I said I want systemd to be able to heal the system. Uh, this if, a if a service dies, it needs to bring it back up. But of course, the, the service has connections. So if just the service comes back without the connections, that doesn't help me at all. Um, so what we need to do is we have to scan all the upstream Jack clients. And if they are alive, we are going to wait. If not, we have to wait for systemd to first bring them up. So I'm traversing this. The, actually, the graph traversal is arbitrary, but this seemed to work best. And then it starts uh, the mod host. And afterwards, it will configure the mod host. Because the mod host, when you start it, has nothing. It doesn't have its own state, and it doesn't, it doesn't um, uh, like uh, load a standard preset. You just have to give it a chain of commands. Uh, which means uh, like instantiate this plugin, connect this plugin, set this parameter, and so on and so forth. Um, and then afterwards, once the thing has been started, we also connect it. And the way that works is I cobbled together this, this configuration system, which is quite 
brain dead, but for me it works very well. So, and for requirements of my client, it had to be JSON. So, I, I learned how to use JQ, which is a, a bash, like, it's a, it's a, it's like a scriptable JSON parser, which is quite funny to use. Actually, it's quite nightmarish, but it does the job. So I'm, I'm just configuring this, so I made the parser understand all this stuff and do the right thing. So basically, it will. the, the point was, if I want to deploy a system like this, I want to just give it a single JSON file, and then... Um, there is a script that's looking at this file, whether it changes, and then it will write out all the system configuration files. For instance, this hostname thing will ultimately end up in slash etc slash hostname. Um, this boot config, these are uh, Raspberry Pi boot bootloader configurations, which will end up in slash boot slash config dot text. So I can, I can give it a maximum frequency. If I want to run it colder, I can do that here and so on. I can uh, prime a couple of GPIOs uh, if I want to use them for like, uh, I have a loudness, like a volume uh, encoder and stuff like that. Um, and here's the systemd units. I, I configure them with this. Um, let's go straight to the Jack service. So that's the name of the unit. The type is a service. It could also be a target or a mount or anything Jack, uh, sorry, system D supports. I enable it. I have this flag there because I don't want to delete everything when I'm not using it and, and then retype it. I can, I can set a Jack name, which nobody should ever do. Um, and this is the options of, of Jack. It's just a standard command line. It's really stupid. And then I give it an array of imports, which is just informational. And output ports it doesn't have because this jack is a sync only, so uh, it, it cannot capture data because there, the hardware doesn't allow for that. Um, this is a little background service that just looks for this config file to change, and as soon as it changes, it parses it and writes out all this, these config files because, like I said, the point was you just deploy this JSON file and you want the, the node to update. So you can basically turn this machine into that machine by just deploying this, this single JSON thing. And then what you do is, the, sorry, the mod host, why can't I scroll right now? Oh, is there a network issue here? Yeah. I just, maybe I shouldn't touch these things that much. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It, I mean, nothing is like properly in, uh, housed and everything. Yeah, so I j apparently I just lost the network connection. Let's see. Yeah, we're back, okay. Robin Garrios uh, remarked that your uh, player, your M player, it, it outputted to Alza, not to Jack, so that's probably quite important. Oh, yeah, yeah, but that's actually, that's the point, because I don't want to, I, I want analog output here. Um, because I'm, I'm literally using the analog output here in order to demonstrate the analog input here. And this one, uh, this thing currently doesn't run Jack. Um, but anyways, um, let's just look at one more thing. Uh, MediaNet config. Um, which is the, the mod host configuration. It's also stupid but effective. Um, it takes the mod host. It... Uh, defines imports and outports. Uh, unfortunately, this is like a bit redundant because you can't query the... It, it would be nice to just have this filled in automatically, but you can't know in advance because it depends on the, on the configuration. Uh, so here are the outports, and with the outports you can say this has a target unit, which is where you want it to be connected to. And the target unit is jackd, which is another section of this file and the, you want to connect it to the first port which is index zero. And this is a l really stupid and it's a lot of typing but the nice thing that is in here is all the knowledge of the complete jack graph which enables a couple of other helper scripts to um, figure out the correct connections which means that if systemd has to restart a dead service it can know what the connections are. 
Uh, and this is just the configuration. Um, this is how you how you talk to a mod host. If you you can you can log into it via telnet and just give it textual commands, which is what my web interface does basically. You say, okay, add these plugins, give them these numbers that you see one, four, and nine in the end, which is uh, the clients that you saw is effect one, effect four, effect nine, whatever. You can use arbitrary numbers; it doesn't make any difference. Um, and then you you connect. You can connect within um, within uh, Modhost. So what I'm doing is I treat Modhost as a as a entity of its own. So Modhost takes care of its own internal connections, just to keep things sim things simpler, and the system D will take care of all external connections. But if you want to split this, you can do that as well. And then I'm setting a few parameters, and then that's it. And then there's another thing that you might want to use if you're an Apple person. Uh, which is a really nice uh, airport compatible streaming client, which I wrote a, a Jack backend for. Uh, it does the job. It's nothing you know, too interesting. And here's the, the Zeta um, jobs. And let's see where this is configured. I'm sorry. Here we have Zeta network to Jack. It's active. And it will output its stuff to the mod host single chain here. And then this stuff is all um, parsed by a script, and it will create in the systemd directory uh, lots of uh, um, lots of uh, information files. Let's let's go to modhost service.d. That's kind of like a standard location for service-related files in, in systemd. Uh, but I created this, and then I make two files. Uh, one is called the mod host service conf, I'm sorry. Uh, and it just has an options variable, uh, which is empty because there are no, I don't use any of the command line options. Uh, but this is then available to the service file. And maybe you remember the, uh, the JackD, uh, it actually had this JackD uh, dollar options and, and that's, that's what ends up here. So the, the point is, of course, I don't want to real-time patch the service files. They should be like system-level immutable. So whenever the configuration um, changes, I do that via an environment file here. And here is the actual options variable that would be used in the, in the service file. And this is what you type at the <coughs> command line when you're a Jack user. Um, yeah. And uh, there's one more, which is the, well, this is actually quite boring. Let's go to the mod host. Uh, there is the connections list. Sorry, uh, mod host service connections. Um, and this is also parsed by another script, which is this uh, MN connect thing that you saw. And it will just make sure that if the system needs to be restarted, it gets repatched. And the reason I did all that was that all the system, the, the, the uh, service managing that I found was, was either very graphically oriented or just too much overhead or I couldn't make it compile on the, uh, on the uh, ARM processor. But uh, I'm sure there's better options for that. Point is this, this works for me right now, except in this case it doesn't. So I still have to like chase my... Uh, um, my signal. Let's see why I lose it. So let me see. Check meter uh, system capture one. And this is already not. And maybe it's just a stupid. Ah, there we go. Yeah. It's hot plugging uh, headphone jacks, and then Alsa does something intelligent to it. So, yeah. What happens here, this is a, f a free jazz improvisation recorded at Merce Festival last year. <laughs> um, analog out, analog in, there is a signal chain. It gets, uh, oh, and this, yeah. And now we can actually use the EQ to work on it. So I have, um, I just need to double check which one I'm working on. Uh, so this is the uh, IP, it's a 128, it's, yeah. It's this one, so I, I've, uh, everything, the, all the access gets tunneled via SSH, which is why it says localhost. And now I can just convince myself that it works. 
by making it a lot softer. Um, and that's basically all this thing is good for. So you can, uh, if you double click on a label, it goes to, it goes to uh, standard. And then here's the part where you can start playing with your, um, with your equalizer to, to uh, improve speakers. And I found that usually, let me turn this a bit down. Uh, I found usually a four band equalizer is significantly enough to, to fix any speaker issues that you might have with the speaker to, to like, say to reach the limits of its, of its quality. Um, maybe one, one more thing. Um, yeah, well, I, I can measure as well. But the thing is that the, like these speakers I found in the trash, they are so bad. Um, you, can, you have to know the limits of what you can do. Like if the speaker doesn't do what you want to do, um, say you have, I, I was working with a broadband speaker once, which is really, spe uh, really cheap. It's, a, it's an eight inch, um, it's an eight inch uh, paper cone, full band speaker. And it drops off at like 11 kilohertz. And also it beams like crazy because it's so big. That means that it has quite a smooth uh, radiation pattern in the lower frequencies. And the higher it gets, the more it becomes like, like a, a, a torch light, like a laser. Which is, of course, not very nice because if you sit off axis, it's dull. And if you sit on axis, it's either just right or too bright. So what we did was we wanted to say, let's see if we can get half an octave out of that. So we put uh, a shelving filter above 10 kilohertz. To, to see if we could extend it a little bit. And that's how I do it. So you, you maybe you carefully uh, listen, okay, this is quite dull. Can I, can I give it a bit more uh, high shelf? And then what we found was quite funny because this paper cone loudspeaker, not only did it have quite a bit of headroom in the treble, so we could get it to go to 14 kilohertz or 15 even, but also by, by using this, this tremendous boost of like 10 decibels, we were causing the, the um, uh, vibration pattern to collapse and to become chaotic because then at some point it doesn't do piston movement anymore so it does only a part of it and then if you, if you excite it more it will produce overtones so the loudspeaker membrane won't do this it will start doing this and the nice thing was that not only did it not break but this laser sharp treble beam got broken up so we, we gained a half an octave and we got a lot nicer radiation pattern just by totally abusing a paper cone broadband loudspeaker, <laughs> which is quite interesting. Um, so that's these, these things that you, that you, that you uh, find out. Of course, there's always the risk of like, damaging the speaker while you do that and while you test the limits of what you can do. Um, it depends also on how, how loud you want to listen. If, if you listen at low volumes, you have a lot of headroom to really abuse the, the tweeter and, and push it. The same with the, the bass speaker. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's one of those things I found. Unfortunately, like, I don't have a real bad speaker here. Uh, these are actually quite modern and, and nice. And the stupid thing with these is I can't really push them much further than that, what they can do. But um, we can see... Um, let me just turn one off. So, and let's see if we can extend the treble response a little bit by using uh, the high shelf. So this already easily goes to 12K. Uh, the bandwidth is, is the slope of where the, the shelf, um, sorry, let me interrupt this. The bandwidth here is not a real bandwidth. It's, it translates to the, the slope of the, f of the shelving filter because it will go on forever, of course, it's a shelf. So um, I don't hear a difference back here, but you probably will. Let me check if this... Ah, it doesn't do much. Yeah. So maybe this is already where it, where it can go. 
what you can always try to do uh, if you have slightly larger enclosures is, is get uh, a bit more base where usually I'm cheating because first of all you have to make sure you don't give the speaker anything it can't do and this frankly can't do anything under 100 hertz but I can just fake base by making sure I cut this stuff that it can't do anyways and then I can take a bell filter where I think it can do shit and just find a bit more double bass there. This is just, I mean, this is not a musical, but you can see where the intervention goes. So now you basically don't hear the double plays much. And if I just crank it ridiculously, you can find it there somewhere. And of course, then you would use also a little bit of Sena kind of music. And then you gradually see what, what the loudspeaker can do. And that is one, uh, one use case that I recommend, and it's really cheap. And the other one, which is why I was going through all this extra complication with the networking and the multicasting, is that this is really nice also as a two-band active amplifier. And then you end up building this thing into a loudspeaker, where you have a separate tweeter and, uh, and bass amp, and then you can run your own crossover. Uh, which is basically also prepared in the system, like Fonts uh, also made a really nice uh, Linkwitz Riley crossover, which you can use. And then you have one box for the left speaker, one box for the right speaker, you connect it with, uh, with network cables. And unfortunately, the only thing I really want to be able to do, the Pi has a, has a power over Ethernet interface, but un unfortunately it's not very good and it also kills the option of using it, but you have to like, it, it's in the way, so you can't easily expand it, you have to like tinker a lot, and you don't get the kind of power that you need, unfortunately. And my dream would be to have an active speaker just connected via power over Ethernet, but to get these 30 watts in there it, with that kind of hardware that they offer is not possible, and I'm still looking on the market. So if anybody knows their way around power EV over Ethernet, I would be interested to, to cooperate. And then you, you have a stereo pair, and then you just need to configure it correctly. So one speaker needs to know I'm the left one, so I take from the Zeta network stream, I take channel one, and the other knows I'm the right one, so it takes channel two. And actually, I'm using that on a daily basis, and it works quite well. And with this, you can scale it up to 5.1, 7.1 if you want to. You can have an active subwoofer where you... B unfortunately, you can't bridge these meaningfully, because, uh, but, but if you only use one, it will have all the power budgets. So if you can use one channel, it, you get 60 watts. It's not enough for a sub, but uh, yeah, you see where, where I'm going with this. No, I'm not using Wi-Fi for several reasons. I also use this kind of platform for art installations and for professional sound reinforcement. And whenever there's an audience, Wi-Fi is basically, uh, you lose, right? Because all of you represent at least one smartphone per person, constantly scanning. So, uh, no, I'm not doing that. Also, I wanted low latency, so this maintains lip sync. Um, and you can't do that over Wi-Fi, you have to buffer to high heaven. And also, I think, actually, I hate this laziness. You know, people, if you can run cables, run a fucking cable. Like, who is teaching people to use Bluetooth for everything? It's just, this is just conceptually wrong. You know, there's, there's things where freedom actually, uh, you get a lot of freedom by using radio spectrum and where it's a killer use case. But as a sound engineer, I mean, we have had this shit called the digital dividend where they've been selling all the radio frequencies that we've been using to make content to the mobile providers, which means that the next Olympics will probably be a repeat of the previous Olympics because you just can't do that kind of broadcast in Europe anymore. So after 2020, we won't have any spectrum left. And I think at home, you shouldn't use this. Because also, if you do, if you stream all your audio over Wi-Fi, and then you want to use your Wi-Fi to get some internet going and maybe watch YouTube, it, you will, like, uh, yeah, you will hinder yourself. So no, that's not what I'm doing. Uh, you can. Uh, of course, thanks to Jack, you could put an IceCast server in here, you could put an Opus encoder in here and a decoder, so you could, could have a data-reduced channel that you can easily HTTP stream via Wi-Fi and then unpack it again, pipe it in the same thing, but then, of course, you have to buffer. So it's, it's actually pretty easy to, to do that. I've, I've tried it. I've used, um, I've used ICES and Dark Ice these IceCast uh, streaming clients. 
So you can do that, actually, it, it, uh, it does that. Okay, um, yeah, that's all I can tell you for now. We can look at any things if you're interested, but are there any questions? Let's just enter into a discussion, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. All right, uh, let me just, here's, a, here's a, um, a URL where you can find all this, all this stuff. Quick question about, um, like, you, you were talking about you could uh, do the EQ stuff with uh, measuring it. Yes. Um, because I know there are some, some like, consumer uh, amps that include some kind of, like, room correction uh, measurements by, like, sign sweeps and stuff. Um, is there, like, any plugin that you could use to automate this? with like a button press to have a sign sweep and then correct? Yes and no. Well, if you, if you use... Because I don't know any plugins. <laughs> if, if you use, there's no plugin that can do that. But if you use DIC FIR, which is available on SourceForge, it one. is an automated process in the sense that all the heuristics to properly inv invert what's been measured is automated. But it means hand editing really complicated page long text files. But then the process is automated. The problem is you can automate it to some degree, but you have to have heuristics to do it. Just imagine you're measuring uh, a frequency response, and it, it looks like this. Because here you have a cancellation, say the loudspeaker interacts with its rear wall. So there's a frequency, there's something that looks like that. Now if you stupidly just invert, you end up with, okay, I have plus 18 dB at 200 hertz. Which means you will have full cancellation at twice the energy, because of course this cancellation never goes away. So your, your automated process needs to understand, is this just a dent in the frequency response, or is that an acoustic cancellation? phenomenon and it needs to tell the difference and ignore the one and deal with the other and that always requires some degree of tuning and then also you need to see if you do room correction it means you can just equalize the loudspeaker in the room or you can even go as far as actively cancel um, modal behavior or reflections if you do that, you have to understand that the more you do it, the smaller your sweet spot will be. So you can, if you just do it for a space the size of your head, you can basically cancel the real wall effects with the frontal speakers uh, quite perfectly. But God help you if you sit like that, <laughs> because then the arrow will be, let's say, twice as much. I'm just making this up, because here is perfect cancellation, and here there isn't. And these decisions to where you should do that and where not, um, require a lot, of, um, a lot of experience and you have to constantly evaluate what you're doing. So uh, there is no automatic process to do it. it. If you just go for frequency response, I think it's quite easy to do that. But actually, I'm not so interested in that because I like the process of m measuring and seeing what the loudspeaker does and also forming an hy a hypothesis of what's going on. Like, for instance, a story I told about this pattern breakup in this, in this paper cone loudspeaker. That's not something that an automated system is ever going to tell you. Because then you have to take your measurement microphone from here to there and go like, whoa, all of a sudden there's treble here. How did it get there? And then, of course, it helps if you have a friend who has access to a laser vibrometer, and then you can actually look at stuff, <laughs> which I'm, I, I haven't done yet, but I'm going to. And it's, uh, no, but uh, to, to answer your question, there is no automated way yet, but I think it shouldn't be too hard to do it. a very brief uh, impression of the actual setup uh, documentation that you have yeah. so that we have an idea if at home we can do this quickly in 15 minutes no. one hour or one full day or a week no perhaps? you you cannot do that in 15 minutes because my uh, system is so badly uh, set up at the moment but actually I'm I know that I should really fix that and I will so uh, what happens is you check the, oh wait, that's a bit big. You, you check this out on GitHub. It's, this is a repository. 
this is still based, unfortunately, on the, on the old Debian release. So currently, it all sits in the Buster branch. Then what you do is you download the, from, from Raspberry Pi.org, you download the standard Buster Lite version that has no UI, nothing. And you, you install it on an uh, on SD card. You mount that SD card, and then what you do is um, here in, I have a, this is named SBIN, but basically what it does is it has my brain dumps in it. So th these are all the little steps that I do in order to transform uh, a standard buster into, into this king thing. And because, of course, you have to do it in the right order, there is these things that first you do this, and there is a set of there is a set of uh, uh, symlinks that that just if you follow these that you will do the right thing, and uh, the the thing will boot up twice uh, because you have to uh, annihilate the old user and you have to restart the SSH with fresh keys. So you know these kind of things. So you it, it's not Windows, but you have to reboot twice when you set it up. Uh, and here is a README, and that is what you do. And of course, this is ridiculous to do it. It's just my internal documentation. What I should do and will do, of course, is create a, uh, an image that you just DD onto that card, and then you're good. So yeah, this is, you have to modify the partition structure, because this thing also is quite robust to uh, abuse. So um, not only does it self-heal if a process dies, which normally doesn't ever happen, but also most of it is read-only. So the entire system has been looked over to work with read-only root and read-only uh, boot anyways. But there is a third partition for state. And you have to redo the partition setup. So if there's any wizards here that know how to really reliably automate a part ed and script it so that it does that automatically. That would be my favorite thing. So I can really tell part it, okay, shrink this partition, check if everything went well. But then there's so many failure modes that I'm a bit paranoid of automating this. Uh, so that's, that's basically what you need to end up with. So you have a, um, a standard uh, boot partition, which because of the bootloader of the ARM needs to be in FAT32. This is the standard Raspbian stuff, and this is a uh, something where you can store music or just whatever, you know. Yeah, and this is, this is how you bootstrap it. And once that's done, I can, if, if you just write me an email, I'll just make a, an image available for you. And then the way it works is you can update, you, you end up with a, with a um, directory slash media net. And the system is, is touched, of course, but everything is symlinked into this overlay. So all the, the files that, that come extra are in this overlay. It's not the most efficient way, but the nice thing is you can, you can just take your standard Raspbian knowledge and go like, okay, what did he change? And then you can see these symlinks, and you see, okay, that's a doctored file that is different from the standard. It's, it's just more like a teaching tool. It doesn't, in actual deployment, this linking shit doesn't make so much sense, but the good thing is you can just look around and see what changed. And hopefully that makes it a bit more useful to... Uh, random passes by. Yeah, but uh, just, just drop me a mail and I'll, I'll be happy to provide uh, uh, an image. Yeah, but uh, the nice thing is I'd, I have to provide the image only once, right? Uh, does anybody know if, if uh, GitHub tolerates like these huge, like two gigabyte kind of files for download or will they kick me out? I don't know. The release, is fine. release is fine, okay, yeah. Then, um. Actually, uh, one thing I should actually do is, sorry, I just, I just ripped this out, but it's back, it's back, you know, it's, uh, I'm very happy, it works even when you show it, and uh, yeah, and the music is still there, damn, it worked, great, that's good, thank you. <laughs>